as buildings transfer their weight to the ground. The builder expects that the ground will oblige by offering a resistance equal to the applied weight. However, behind this simplistic assumption lies the crucible of soil mechanics, the so-called principle of effective stress. And it is this principle that controls all ground behaviour of interest to the engineer. So, let's start with something familiar. We know buildings transfer their weight to the soil, either through columns, as point loads, or as uniform loading, through walls. If the soil was to directly receive these loads, it most likely would respond, much like a clumsy young dancer who inadvertently places his foot beneath his partner's stiletto heel. Intense pain or stress follows as a relatively small load is applied over a tiny area. Had the young lady been wearing loafers, the outcome would have been entirely tolerable, although unpleasant, as the load would have been spread over a much greater area. And so it is with building loads. Concentrated point or uniform loads are spread over a greater area via footings. The footings are proportioned by the engineer so that the stress they deliver to the ground is much less than the stress required to fail the soil. Let's examine this a little further. Starting with a dry soil and honing in on a small area or element directly beneath the soil. Starting with a typical foundation subjected to a point load P. The load is transferred via the foundation over an area A and this results in a stress equal to the force over the area. This stress is further distributed into the soil as shown. If we concentrate on a small area beneath this foundation, we can see that the soil grains transfer the load through a series of contact points or grain to grain contact. Moving on from this, engineers are often required to calculate the stress at a given depth due to the weight of soil above. This is known as the total stress and can be calculated from the unit weight gamma multiplied by the depth of soil Z. And this leads to our first important lesson. Soil resists foundation or compressive loading by grain to grain friction. Interestingly, as soils are made up of millions of individual particles resting one on top of the other, they are essentially unbonded and this leads us to our second important lesson, and that is soils have no strength when subjected to tension. What happens when it rains or the water table rises and water enters the void space between the particles? By filling the void spaces, the unit weight of the soil increases and hence the total stress increases. But the presence of water in the void space also causes a buoyancy effect, making each particle lighter and thus reducing the interparticle friction. So hold that thought. I want to take you back now to your childhood days playing on the beach. From a very early age we knew that compacting sand within a small bucket and turning it upside down gave us beautiful sand castles. They stayed standing because they had strength. We refer to this strength as sheer strength. We also played with water and every time we tipped our bucket we found that the water just ran flat across the ground. From this we can deduce that water has no sheer strength and therefore adds nothing to the soil strength. So it is really the intergranular friction that provides the strength and because the presence of water reduces the friction we subtract it from the total stress to give what's known as effective stress. As effective stress governs soil behaviour, it is imperative that we are comfortable calculating effective stresses under various conditions. We'll do this in our next video, so click here.